Well, good morning, beloved. Trust that you're doing well. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to go to the book of Revelation this morning, Revelation chapter 2. Just a brief word of thanks to Mark and to Jacob. And just, I was telling the first service what a joy it is to be able to preach behind such wonderful worship. Um, Sometimes have the opportunity to go and speak other places, and it's just there's nothing like what takes place here. It doesn't mean that other places are good or bad or whatever. It's just something special that the Lord is doing here at Crossway, and so we're thankful for that this morning. Uh, again, inviting you to uh, the book of Revelation this morning, Revelation chapter 2. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning, a Christ-centered church. If you would stand as we pay honor to the reading of God's Word this morning. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. This is the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is God's word to us, and we're thankful for him preserving it. Let's ask him now for his help as we study it. Father, we come to you this morning as weary and, and needing people. We come to you as people who need to hear from your word as people who hopefully, like you, instructed us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we know that we'll find satisfaction in your word this morning. So as we study your word together, would you move through the preaching and the proclamation of it? Because I know this morning that it won't be anything that I say, but it's as your spirit moves through the proclamation of your word that accomplishes the changing of man's heart. We ask that you would be with us Help us to search out this text to see if there is any way in which we need to change to be more like you this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know about you. Have you ever thought about why you do the things that you do or have ever found yourself in a situation where you're wondering, like, why are we doing this? Why are we even here right now? Like, what is going on? Um, I had such an occasion happen to me when I was a, a junior in high school uh, in pretty much, I think, a normal course of a high schooler's life. Every Friday night, find yourself typically at a football field watching or playing football. That's just typical. Um, I myself did not play uh, high school football, uh, mainly because I have a strong aversion to losing. Um, and in the four years that I attended high school, I think our football team may have won five or six of the 36 games that they played over the course of those four years. And when they won, it was very exciting because nobody expected it to happen. But more, more frequently was uh, the loss. And there's this one particular Friday night that stands out in my mind uh, because with about three minutes to go in the second quarter, uh, and with the game pretty much well in hand, I, I believe the score was somewhere in the neighborhood of 53 or 56 or 60 or 63 to nothing. I mean, it, it was, the game had been settled a long time ago. And I turned to my friend and I said, what are we doing here? Because I mean, like, we're not, like, we're not helpful. Like, we're not cheering them on. Like if the other school had said, we've got spirit, yes, we do. We've got spirit, how about you? We would have told them just to keep it. Because <laughs> we have none. And my friend sheepishly looked at me and he said, 
because this is where the girls are. <laughs> At least we know why we're here. On a more serious note, have you ever thought though about what the church should be about? Like what the church should focus on? Have you ever thought about what it actually operates and why it exists and what its purpose is? Uh, have you... A have you ever taken stock of the reason why you attended the churches you attend? I think sometimes we just kind of, like, this is what you do. It's Sunday, it's the Lord's day. We're supposed to be in church. We're good, you know, Christian people. So that's where we're gonna be. Have you actually though thought about why you're here? Have you ever given a moment's thought to why the church would gather? And then why you specifically, not just the church corporately, but you specifically are here. Why did you come this morning? Why did you get up this morning and decide to come to church? I think the temptation for many people is we can convince ourselves that we're doing things because of what we might miss out of if we weren't to do it. Like, what will people think? I have standing in the church. I have standing in the community. What will happen if I don't show up? Will they notice? Will I be judged? I better get over to church because I don't want to, like, I don't want anybody to think I'm a bad Christian. Rather than something animating the reason why you're here, instead of what others will think, but why we've gathered to worship. Is it possible this morning for you and me that we might be missing the reason why we should be here? Jesus, writing to the churches that made up this little conglomerate in Asia Minor, writes a letter to the church at Ephesus. And it's a different letter than the other letters in this particular section of the Bible in that it tells the church at Ephesus some things that they are doing well, while at the same time confronts them on a major issue that they need to take stock of. And I think it's important for us this morning to look at this particular letter and evaluate, not corporately, not Crossway Baptist Church, but me individually. Where am I at in my relationship with Jesus Christ? And then from there, where is the church at? To be clear this morning, I believe that we have the privilege of serving and ministering and working at and attending a church that loves Jesus Christ. But the New Testament is constantly full of warnings to take a look inside. And the danger this morning is that if you get off path, I think this is where the danger is. The danger is that a church that doesn't correct when it's two steps off the path will soon find itself miles off target. And a person, likewise, who finds themselves a step, a half a step, two steps off the path that doesn't correct themselves finds them miles off the path. Sometimes we're like, wow, what happened at that church? Why did they go crazy? What happened there? Why did it become haywire there? It wasn't because one Sunday morning they just woke up and were like, you know what? We're kind of just tired of doing things the way that we always did. Let's go nuts this one Sunday. It's a slow progression that pulls a church and a people off a of mission. And so what I want to try and do this morning is show you from this particular text what Jesus commands, what Jesus corrects, and then what Jesus calls the people to do. So first, what does Jesus commend? Well, he commends and he tells them that the doctrine and work matters. The, the doctrine and the work of the church matters. Look at verse number one. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not yet become weary. So Jesus says here that this particular church has strong doctrine and work, but 
Here's the temptation this morning. The temptation is when we're reading this entire passage to immediately see the call of losing love and miss the the broader point. Because in our culture and society, it has become very commonplace to hyper fixate on love. And sometimes we will sacrifice things on the basis of making sure we are fitting into a cultural narrative. And the word love is a buzzword if there ever has been one in our society right now. We don't know what it means. We don't know what it does. We don't know what it accomplishes. We just know we're supposed to have it, which is very, very dangerous, especially in the life of the church, because Jesus commends this this church for two things before he corrects them. He wants them to understand that there are things that are worthy of praise here in Ephesus. First, he commends their work. He commends their work. The church in Ephesus was a hardworking church. Now, if we were gonna put it into modern terms, if we're gonna say, what did Ephesus look like comparatively to a modern church? This church was a church that was committed to meeting together, gathering and serving the people of God. They would have been the church that was faithful to meet regularly, faithful to have classes, life groups and programs for the people, faithful to have a thriving age-graded ministry. They would have emphasized students going to camp They would have emphasized people giving their lives to vocational ministry. They would have encouraged the people to consider whether or not they should become missionaries to support missions and to send them out. This is a church that would have been committed to planting churches and seeing their church grow. For all intents and purposes, this is a strong and great church. And it is, and it was. That's why Jesus is commending them because they had gone to work. They understood the work that the church should be about. The second thing that Jesus commends them on though is their commitment to sound teaching. The church at Ephesus didn't put up with false teachers. They were not welcome in the gathering. You can read that in verse number two and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. This wasn't a church that just went through the motions of doing the work and saying we believe sound doctrine. They said to the people in the gathering, when a false teacher would pop up and say, I'm an apostle, they said, prove it. And when those apostles were liars, they said, you're a liar. This is not a church to mess around in and think, well, we'll advance false teaching through claiming to be an apostle and expect them not to do the checking. They made sure that they didn't support false teachers and they opposed false teachers by name. And in our culture and society that we live in, we're like, well, we're going to allude to people. You know, this is the age of the subtweet, the sub reference on social media. You say something on social media, everybody knows what you're talking about, even though you didn't say anything. We are the passive aggressive culture. Here in the first century, unlike the prosperity theology people of today that name and claim false, te- false uh, doctrine about money, the church at Ephesus was a name it and claim it church in a good way. They named and claimed false teachers by name. You don't get to run around in our town spouting false theology without us calling you out by name, like everybody in our gatherings gonna know who's in error in our city because we're calling them out by name. Now we're like, well, we just don't wanna offend people or give people airtime. Come on. It's we're afraid that we live in the soundbite era where that something we're gonna say, where we call people out for false teaching and error is gonna get played on the five o'clock news and we're gonna be embarrassed because there's our church getting played out in the media. The, the church at Ephesus didn't care. Life is too short and hell is too real to joke around about who's teaching false theology in our city. That's the church at Ephesus. They were saying our doctrine and our work matter. So in in light of this whole passage though, where Jesus is gonna call them out for losing their first love, what are we supposed to take away from this commending their doctrine and their work? Well, number one, I think we need to understand that we should never sacrifice the work of the church for love. 
Sometimes we're gonna sacrifice the work of the church. We're gonna be like, well, you know, we don't want anybody to be really offended, so we're never gonna call them out for not doing what Christians are supposed to do. We're never gonna bring to attention the fact that they've been going to church here for 43 years. They've never served. They're not really plugged in. They come as they want to. They give as they want to. This is kind of like a country club membership from them. So, you know, we're, we don't want them to feel unloved, so we're not gonna say anything. The church at Ephesus was never going to sacrifice the work that needed to be done by the body of believers for the sake of love. The other thing they weren't going to do is they were never going to sacrifice the doctrine of the church for love. Now, this really hits home today because the reality is everyone sitting in church says, I'm robust, I believe rich, sound theology, right up until you have to tell someone that the way in which they're living is inconsistent with what the Bible has to say. We're like, well, I just don't wanna be unloving. It is not unloving to let people live in error as though they'll just magically come out of it. Think about how you came to know Jesus Christ. Was it through people loving you? Yes, absolutely. How did they love you? By sharing the message of the gospel. What's the message of the gospel, David? Well, I'm glad you asked. That you and I are sinners who are completely incapable of saving ourselves and that Jesus Christ lived a perfect and sinless life and died on the cross for us, that we might be rescued, redeemed, and restored to Jesus Christ. And that if we will place our faith and trust in Christ alone, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us and make us whole before him. That is not a loving message. In a in the world in which we live. It is not loving to tell people, oh, by the way, I love you, but you're wicked, guilty, sinful, and lost. But I love you. People are like, that doesn't feel loving. Well, praise God, feelings aren't determinative of facts. The church can never get itself into a position where it sacrifices the doctrine or the work that they do on the name of we are being loving because it always undercuts the message because there is no way for you to live with the world and call them to the message that the Bible calls them to. Now you're gonna, you're gonna come at me at this point and say, but aren't we, didn't Jesus say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? Don't you remember that, David? We, four years ago, we were constantly told how we need to love our neighbor. Well, just remember this, that the church gets itself into trouble when our doctrine and our work is not fueled by Christ's love. So it's, this is not a call to doctrine work. If you, if, you, if you read this text and you go, doctrine work, yes, no love, yes, you don't get it. But the fact is that Jesus Christ himself commends doctrine and work in this text. And too many times we rush over what God commends because we're going, oh, we don't love people the way we should. Friends, we need to make sure that all of our life is in alignment with God's word, not just bits and pieces, which is why we come to this second observation. What is Jesus Christ gonna correct here? Well, he's going to say this, that love in the church is essential. Look at verse number four. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you left your first love. Now, what does it mean to leave your first love? Well, abandoning your first love then means that you and I, or this church had strayed from both love of God and love of fellow believers because the two are inseparable. I take you back to the verse I just referenced. Jesus Christ, when questioned about what's the greatest commandment, said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is impossible for me to love my neighbor with the way I'm supposed to, unless I first love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. But it is also impossible for me to love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength 
and then turn around and not love my neighbor. The two are inseparable. So Jesus Christ says, you've left your first love. The church at at Ephesus had become this wonderful church of persistent sound teaching, but a hardness and a callousness had risen up inside of it. And what the church at Ephesus needed now was a renewed fervency, a renewed tenderness for the Lord. True doctrine, true work for Jesus Christ is always warm and loving and generous in spirit. Which is why I've said, if you are someone who's like, I'm really passionate about doctrine and theology, but I really don't like people. I say, you really don't understand doctrine and theology. You really don't. Because as we grow in our love for Lord, it, the Lord, it naturally makes us more tender towards people. There were two areas where this love had grown cold and they needed to be addressed though in the proper order. The first area was a love for Christ. There was a spirit of let's do the work of the church devoid of the one who motivates the work. Somewhere along the way, the work had become more important than the one they were doing the work for. You see, it's possible this morning for you to have shown up at church and for you to be like, David, you don't get it. I'm all in. I hear that you're all in and I see that you're all in. I see you serving and I see you plugged into your life group and I see you here Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. I see you. You would have walked into the church at Ephesus and seen the same thing because here's the bottom line. You can do a lot of things externally while your heart is far from the Lord. It is possible to to be lacking in love for Jesus Christ and still going through the motions of serving him. The question this morning is, what is the chief animating desire of your heart? Because if it's anything other than Jesus, ultimately the work that you do will be unsustainable. A few weeks ago I was traveling and... uh, stopped and managed to get to the place where I was supposed to be early and had some free time. And uh, we've got two kids, five and two. And I was by myself like for like that day and spend the night, speak the next day and go home. So I had some rare free time. And you think, you know, five and two, that calls for a nap, right? Because it's like, there's not a whole lot of quality rest time with five and two. I don't really know that there's really any quality rest time from the time a child is born until they really, um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I've got brothers and sisters that are giving my parents, like they're, they're in their late 20s and they're giving my parents a run for their money. And I'm like, this is not looking good for me. So I had a rare free time. So most people would be like, take a nap and then you recharge and you're ready to go. Not me, I was in just outside of Tulsa And so I had prepared beforehand that I would walk in the path of the Lord. And so within 20 minutes of dropping my stuff off, I was in downtown Tulsa at a bookstore because that's where God's people go to be encouraged. Maybe not God's people, but at least this follower of Jesus Christ. Because in my life, when it comes to the list of things that my heart delights in, I'm hoping not chief, but definitely in like the top five are books, which is really helpful because people are like, oh, like you're a pastor. It's so nice that you're into like reading and stuff. That's got to be very beneficial to you. I'm like, I wouldn't be reading if I dug ditches. Like you don't understand. I want to be in, with, around, by books. Like they are my friends. They don't have bad attitudes. If you don't like them, you take them back to the bookstore. If they get on your nerves, you put them on a shelf and they leave you alone until you decide to be annoyed by them again. They are wonderful companions. But I found myself in this part of downtown Tulsa that was, uh, I'll say, not on my ideological spectrum. There were different flags in this part of the city, not flags that I would salute or put my hand or pledge allegiance to or even know sometimes what they meant. But as I walked through that area, I just kind of chuckled because I, while I do love books, the question about desires is what animates above that desire? 
because I had walked into this section. Uh, I just kind of chuckled as I was walking down the, the sidewalk. I, I walked into this section of town and I had on this t-shirt that said on the front of it, good news. And then on the back of it has this this little paper boy with a paper in his hand and underneath of it, it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news to those who have not yet heard. And I thought, that's what the Christian life is about. It's about this. It's letting your desires be animated and driven by your love of Jesus Christ. Meaning that there isn't a desire that you have that isn't controlled by Jesus Christ and governed by Jesus Christ and isn't utilized by Jesus Christ to advance Jesus Christ. But you'll never do that if Jesus Christ isn't the chief animating desire of your heart. And some of you are like, that's dumb. That's ridiculous. I can't believe you go to a bookstore. Right, and you go out on a bass boat and you throw a plastic wall worm into the water for eight hours, you catch nothing, you come home and you lie about it and you break commandments doing it. Come on. Like the reality is we all have desires. They're probably different for each and every person. I'm convinced the older I get that the reason why men become uh, fascinated with deer hunting is not really to kill deer. It's a couple hours in the woods where they can take a nap and be bothered by no one in a deer stand. They just need some quality alone time. But the question is, how are those desires leveraged in such a way that Jesus Christ still remains the chief animating desire of your heart? He must reign supreme over everything, not just over the avenues that you want him to. The problem at the church at Ephesus is that Christ had diminished in his proper place of honor. He wasn't seen as most beautiful or most supreme. And he was not the chief desire of their hearts. And I don't care where you go to church, but it is when the people of God no longer have Jesus Christ as their chief animating desire that the church begins to drift. People are like, well, it's the pastor. It's the people who tolerate teaching in error because their hearts have drifted and they no longer hold Jesus Christ in high esteem that the church begins to drift. But notice what that drift does. It causes you and me to grow cold in our love for other people. The church had lost its love for other people. You see, you can still guard good doctrine this morning and not love other people. You can be right in your assessment of false teachers and not love other people. You just spend an hour on the internet and you can find that out. Real robust, sold out Johnny Super Christians on the internet, just speaking in ways that are completely unkind, ungodly. And I would just even be willing to say wicked to people around them. But they're like, but our doctrine is right. Well, yes, but... Doctrine without love is devoid of Christ. You've got to take the whole picture of Jesus Christ and look at his life and his ministry. This is a person who understood how to walk in and overturn temples or uh, overturn temples, overturn tables. Well, this is another metaphor for another time. Overturn tables and yet be loving and kind to people who are far from him. It is possible to do both things. When we lose our love for Christ, it's not long before we lose our love for other people. But when I love Christ properly, I remember what he has done for me. I remember what he has forgiven me of. And I remember the love that he has shown me. When I'm reminded of Christ's love for me, I will love others properly. But before you can begin to address a problem, you have to admit that there's a problem in the first place. And the tricky thing about a text like this is you are the only person who can address this problem this morning. You're the only person who can take inventory of your own heart and know if you've drifted. Sure, I can look, maybe see signs, maybe not. Some of you are probably very talented as I am in my own life of being able to go through the motions. I've, I, let's just be transparent. If you have small children, if you have children, if you've been around people at any time trying to get them to church on time, whether they're grown or little, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 
I've been with, with groups of people who are all adults and we're fussing at each other because we can't get out the door on time. And you're having intense fellowship all the way to church in the car. You're hoping nobody walks up and sit. You're, you're thankful you go to a church where there aren't greeters out in the parking lot, like knocking on windows. Hey, how's it going? Because that at least gives you a buffer time to like let the steam out as you walk in the door. And people are like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great, brother. It's great to serve the Lord. Yeah, Jesus is king. Let's go, team Jesus. Never mind the fact that you've just threatened a child within an inch of their life about an hour ago. Some children are currently scared because they're teaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ down in the kids area. And you threatened them with that on the way here. <laughs> it is possible to come in and look right, smell right, walk right, talk right, and be far from the Lord. You're the only person who can tell if you drifted. So what's the solution? Well, thankfully, Jesus Christ gives us the solution. He doesn't just commend and correct, or we could say he doesn't just commend and call out without giving a way back. And that's why we notice in verses five and seven that the way to recover is to repent and to return. We read, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Then Jesus says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The warning is severe and the call to repent and return is significant because the implications are life altering. Now we sit in a room this morning with LED lighting and, and everything's pretty bright. And so you read a text like this, you're like, Jesus is gonna come and take their lamp. Like who, who cares? We got tons of light. Well, thankfully, hopefully you can recognize metaphor this morning because removing the lampstand doesn't mean that Jesus is just clicking off a light. It means the church will lose its status as a Christian church. And I wanna stress this point this morning. Removing the lampstand means the church will lose its status as a Christian church. It won't lose its status as a Baptist church. It won't lose its status as a Presbyterian church. It won't, re, won't lose its status as a Reformed church or a Lutheran church or a non-denominational church or a Bible church. It will lose its status as a Christian church. And I think there's a lot of times where we fail to recognize that there are lots of churches open this morning where somebody will get up and talk, not reference the Bible. They will give a webinar, seminar, something's going on, TED Talk, no content of Jesus Christ, no message of the gospel, no pointing people to Jesus Christ. That is a Christless church. And the warning that the lampstand would be removed and no longer be a Christian church should shake us to our core. Why? Because a Christless church, a church without a Christian lamp is the... It, what it means is that the light of Christ will no longer shine. The message of the gospel will no longer resound from a church that has lost its first love. Because beloved, trust me this morning, when a church loses its first love of Jesus Christ, it's not long before that church lo loses its love for other people. But here's the dangerous thing. Unless it is awakened to the reality of losing its first love, it will continue to drift into meaningless error. And much like when we read about Samson in the book of Judges, when the text reads that Samson got up to do what he had always done, but did not realize that the Lord had left him. That is a picture of the church that has lost its first love. They do their work. They look like they, they may even look like they're on mission, but they, don't, they do not even know that the Lord is not with them which is why we find this text so relevant today because it is a warning. It is a clear cut warning to us to make sure that we take pure inventory of our heart. So let me ask you this this morning. For you who might be sitting in here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, you're not a Christ follower, you wouldn't even know that language or you wouldn't understand any of what I've been talking about up to this point, it is impossible. So you're like, repent and return right? Because you've never repented in the first place. 
You cannot return to a place you've never been. So the call for you sitting in this room who do not know Jesus Christ as your savior is simply to come to know Jesus Christ, to place your faith and trust in him alone for the forgiveness of your sins. And this is a place that loves to help people know how they can do that. But then the other call this morning is for those of us who are Christ followers, for those of us who are Christ followers, to take inventory of our own heart and to say, have I lost my first love? Has my heart, like the hymn writers used to sing, the old timers used to say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. This morning, Jesus Christ offers you an opportunity to repent and return and to come back to where you used to live and live there again. So the question this morning is, what will you do with what God's word calls you to do? Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. If you have more questions, or maybe you're that person who's looking to take their next step in their walk with Christ, we would love nothing more than to connect with you through our website. For service times and information about other events and activities at Crossway, you can connect with us at crosswaybc.org. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We hope to see you again soon.